Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Food power is everywhere. Food power is not new technology. Food power cut the Grand Canyon. The majority of people have no idea what food power is influencing. The limits for fluid power are still not defined. There's no other technology that even comes close in terms of power density. For a mechanical engineer, fluid power is a great place to be. The things that were impossible just a few years ago are now possible. It's energy storage. It's like a really powerful muscle. If you just step outside and take a look, you're pretty sure that everything you see out there has had some fluid power applied to it. And on top of that, the cherry on the cake is digitization of hydraulics. You get kind of this sort of visceral thrill of feeling when you get to see this really big arm go <laughs> <laughs> Discovering Fluid Power is a co-production of the University of Minnesota's Center for Compact and Efficient Fluid Power and TPT's Minnesota Channel. Additional support for this program has been provided by the National Fluid Power Association and the National Science Foundation. see it everywhere. If you go to a construction site, almost all the equipment in the construction site, for example, the excavators, the backhoes, and so on, that, that's fluid power. If you fly in an airplane, um, all of the control surfaces in the, in the airplane are controlled by fluid power. If you have a car with an automatic transmission, that transmission uses fluid power. When you're driving your car, your foot actually doesn't have enough power to stop the car on its own. They use the hydraulic advantage of your foot pushing down on the pedal, amplify that power through the hydraulic advantage, and give you power braking, which does have the power to stop your car. Fluid power, elevators, um, you know, your chairs in the office every time you blow down the lever, that's pneumatics. Uh, I guess part of the beauty of fluid power is it's such a simple thing. It's, you know, you have a cylinder, you have a pressurized liquid, and it's pushing one way or the other, so. Fluid power, it's a way to move really big stuff really fast in a really small package. It's using a gas or a liquid under pressure to move a piston or a shaft to do work. Just like you would use a lever to transmit energy or, or masses through a mechanical means, the lever gets replaced by a fluid lever compress or expand that fluid to create more or less lever forces on your end result. I can see it, I can intuitively understand what's going on, it's at a scale that, that makes sense to me. You can touch it, you can feel it, you can see it. Fluid power is on the human scale. I can see a valve shifting, I can see a pump turning, I see oil moving inside of a hose. touches our daily lives. You find it in entertainment industries, you find it in large construction machinery, in agricultural equipment, and in a nutshell, it's a lot of power in a very tiny package. And the fact that this fluid power component systems are so powerful, is really has a lot of uh, kind of fun uh, associated with it. So you see big things moving and moving at high speed and very impressive. There's an art museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin that uses hydraulic technology to reshape the outside of the building in interesting ways. Uh, and there's probably no other technology that could have achieved that. The 
fluid power is so flexible and can be can be used in so many different areas that I found that's exciting. Anything from foundries, primary metals, civil engineering projects, bridges, dams, locks, um, cranes, port equipment, agricultural tractors and combines, harvesting equipment. The list goes on and on and on and this is just a testimonial of how diverse this industry is and how exciting opportunities this industry provides across multiple industries. It's all around us and it, and it helps us in our everyday life. First example is fluid power cut the Grand Canyon. So that's a pretty tangible, pretty tangible example of what fluid power can do. Secondly is that it makes our lives easier every day. Fluid power is used to transport uh, ag tractors from A to B. So it's the main propulsion technology to move the tractor. Of course, it's also used for the lifting of the buckets on backhoe loaders. Uh, um, and so it's, when you look at a, an off-road piece of equipment, fluid power actuation takes 70 to 80 percent, if you will, of the available power transmission that happens on that machine. And the funny thing is you can't see it from the outside. <laughs> All you see is a nice colorful machine driving by and you're wondering how that works and if you lift up the hood and you see some hoses then you start to get the idea that that's actually some hydraulic fluid driving that machine. Human beings, typically what, we can lift 20, 30, 40 pounds, maybe if you're really strong, 100 pounds. Um, it would take a lot of people to be able to lift bridge sections into place. Things like a lawn sprinkler, it's, it's being spun by it's being turned by water that's entering it. So I, I guess the, these are things that we kind of see every day and it doesn't maybe fit an idea of fluid power as hydraulics and you have all these hoses and, and stuff, but it's, it's an object being driven by, by a fluid. And when I started finding out that it was heart pumps, when I started realizing that the only reason why an airplane flies is hydraulics. The only reason why somebody lives through a surgery is because of the pneumatics and the respirator or the heart pump. Then I started to realize, wow, there's something really profound here. I think people think of kind of fluid power as uh, the grandpa's technology kind of that it's used to, that people just think of it as kind of being um, big and, and clunky, noisy, leaky. I think those ideas will, will disappear over time as people see fluid power as being used in their life. I think the time is ripe now for some really exciting new applications of fluid power. Some of the technology uh, innovations that are influence, influencing us today are the convergence between electronics and hydraulics. Um, 25 years ago, it, the way you controlled hydraulic systems were by levers uh, and by mechanical inputs. That's almost gone today. Really what we call mechatronics is a really important trend, which is taking what people think is your grandfather's pneumatics or hydraulics and adding in a lot of electronics, and then on top of that, control theory. And a lot of students are interested in mechatronics, but what they mostly understand is electrics and mechanics together. The beauty of fluid power is that it involves electrics, mechanics, but also fluid power and brings this together. So it's a, a challenging combination of, uh, of, uh, of systems, I would say. Yeah. With digital control loops, we're able to make measurements and adjust the forces and the motions thousands of times a second. We're able to add digital filters. We're able to add digital calculation algorithms into this control loop. So we're able to measure something, filter it, do some calculations on it, and then adjust the force that's being applied thousands of times a second. So our machines are much more accurate, much more repeatable, greater finesse or fidelity is accomplished with these control technologies. It's had a profound impact on the way we employ fluid power in our systems. What, what software and electronics are doing for hydraulics is it's, it's taking the 
the operator interface, which today is things like steering wheels and levers and buttons in a, in a cab. Uh, and they're turning it into the same devices that you see in video games. We have very tiny little electronic steering wheels. We have joysticks with little lever buttons, uh, thumb wheels. Uh, those are the common inputs today for a variety of mobile equipment. And we oftentimes talk in the company about the next wave of machine operators isn't gonna be the person uh, who grew up with mechanical levers as the way to drive the machine. It's gonna be the person who played the video games when they were 10. <laughs> and now they're used to working with joysticks as their input. And if they don't have that, they're saying, what is this old fashioned machine? So it's opening up a lot of avenues and I think it's also stretching people's minds because um, as the technology continues to evolve, you're starting to think about the problems you're facing every day a little differently. When you start to see solutions evolve and you say, hmm, maybe I should rethink the way I organize my farm and how much equipment I buy at the end of the, at the, end of the season, et cetera, because uh, the productivities are increasing uh, and the, the comfort the ease of uh, use and the comfort for the operators increasing, it's getting to be uh, uh, a lot of benefits for the end customers. What we're trying to do um, in our center is to migrate food power from those traditional heavy uses, that's uh, construction, agriculture, um, mining, and so on, to um, uses more on the human scale. One of the great advantages of pneumatics is that it is, uh, air is compressible. So when you push on something that is pneumatic, it compresses and that gives it a very fluid, human-like motion. In many cases, uh, we don't want that, you use hydraulics or electric drives, but to have some compliance is really important. In anything that acts upon a human, it's what they expect. Uh, you don't want something pumping your chest that uh, would crush your chest. You want it to kind of move with you, and pneumatics is very good with, with interacting with humans. And pneumatics are used in uh, equipment that grows bone cells for transplants, and they've discovered that when they grow cells in a Petri dish, they don't grow as well, and they die, or they don't get as many transplant cells. So our systems are used to create a heartbeat on a flexible membrane and the cells grow more quickly and they live better, which makes transplants work better. Open heart surgery is only made possible with a heart-lung machine, a machine that replaces the function of the heart and lungs during the open heart surgery. Uh, this is basically a pump. It's moving the fluid, your blood, through your body so that your heart can be stopped and they can perform surgery on a non-beating heart. So a primary example of a fluidic application that is literally saving lives every day. One of the activities in fluid power that's I think most exciting is in the area of orthotics. And orthotics uh, simply means a, a brace or some kind of a system that you wear that can help you to move better. It's something that fluid power really hasn't gone into before. I mean, you think of fluid power and you think of huge excavators and dump trucks and things like that. You don't think of a tiny little brace that somebody's going to be wearing around. The orthosis test bed is trying to see if we can actually make fluid power uh, scalable to sort of the human scale in terms of you know, the types of uh, power output levels that, that humans uh, output and the sizes that humans uh, use. We are simulating forces that are very dynamic. Uh, when a person is walking, it's a, it's, a, it's a gait that typically two or three steps per second for somebody who's walking quickly. And to try and reproduce those forces of a person, especially a larger person walking at that gait, uh, it's very difficult to do it electronically. When we originally started, we said, okay, there are a couple things we want to do. One is we want to test the boundaries of fluid power, okay? So um, how small can we go? I mean, that was the, one of the key things. Uh, that was driving us, you know, miniaturization. How small can we make this? It's a great project because it's going to basically pull in um, research that's getting done by other projects in the center. As soon as we figure out how to get this thing to respond. The other thing that we looked at was, can we do something that is going to be uh, of benefit to society? We're interested in orthoses that you can strap on that can essentially replace that weak muscle. Sometimes it's the ankle, sometimes they're at the knee. 
You could have ankle, um, wrist braces, elbow braces. Our end of the year goal is to have a prototype for, that we could, a brace that we could actually um, put on somebody's leg and have them walk around and it fully function. I mean, that's, that's progress, right? And right now, most fluid power systems in the medical world are outside the body. And I think one of the things we'll start to see in the next 10, definitely 20 years, are fluid power devices embedded inside the body. So things that pump blood, things that help run the heart, things that help run other organs will actually be very small, lightweight, very efficient fluid power systems that can actually be embedded in the body. And that's, that's real technology and it's really, really happening. One of the ways fluid power is changing the world is in the energy area. There is a huge demand for primary energies, whether it's oil, gas, biomass, wind energy, solar energy, or ocean energy. And when I think about hydraulics, it touches every one of these applications. Wind power, we see the windmills out there, Hydraulics is hidden in the windmill. People don't normally recognize that hydraulics actually controls the blade of some of these windmills. Solar energy is another very, very attractive renewable energy uh, application. Ocean power, where you harness the motion of the ocean waves on the surface of the ocean. You take that energy, you store it, you use that energy to, uh, to create uh, electricity, for instance. Unbelievable applications where imagination is your limit. You have the ability to harness and store energy uh, in a hydraulic or pneumatic system uh, that you don't have in other uh, kinds of technologies. Another um, important application of fluid power is in the transportation sector. You have heard about the uh, electric hybrid, Toyota Prius and others, where um, the idea is to use brake energy to store it in a battery and uh, then to use it for acceleration. Now in fluid power, we have a counterpart to that, which I believe, strongly believe, can do much better than the ele electric hybrid, hydraulic hybrid. Uh, we want to improve the efficiency of a vehicle. A lot of, a lot of energy is wasted when you brake a vehicle, when you slow a vehicle down, that, that energy is dumped in heat in the brakes. If we can harvest that energy and reapply that energy immediately to reaccelerate the vehicle, we're gonna save a lot of energy. When you brake a vehicle, you can take the energy of the kinetic energy of your vehicle, dump it into a hydraulic, into a hydraulic accumulator, store that energy, and then immediately have it available to dump it back into a hydraulic motor and reaccelerate the vehicle. So this is one of the areas where, where fluid power the fact that it's very compact, very high density energy storage really lends itself to rapid energy capture and rapid energy redeployment in energy savings. The hydraulic side has already been Im implemented on large commercial vehicles that start and stop a lot. If we were going to add hydraulics to uh, Small, small vehicles, we need to get the weight down and we need to get the size down. How do we get the technology and fluid power to the point where we can start to compete with the age-old technology on passenger cars? Some people would look at that as the holy grail. It would be an, an opportunity for fluid power to start touching the average person. <laughs> this is the uh... Uh, what will be the small urban vehicle, uh, a, a hydraulic hybrid vehicle. So it uses both a, a conventional internal combustion engine as well as uh, hydraulic uh, pump motors. This is the engine that we will be using. It's a diesel engine and it produces, only needs to produce half as much power as the engine that was originally in the vehicle. The goal is that the vehicle be able to go from zero to 60 miles per hour in eight seconds. But the, uh, hopefully a number of miles per gallon will be greatly increased. The goal is, is about 100 miles per gallon. 
technology from other schools will be incorporated in, in the vehicle as time proceeds. The technology as the research continues to progress is getting more compact, is getting more efficient, um, is becoming more mobile, so it's not uh, tethered to a particular power source. Uh, and that's opening up a whole new window in the world of robotics. The, in the center, we are looking at uh, applications, particularly for rescue vehicles. Robots which are able to uh, encounter the very unstructured environments of a disaster scene and negotiate those obstacles which could be fallen uh, structures, uh, soil, if you think of a mine disaster, uh, it might be, it might even be water in some cases. In order for robots to be useful, they have to be able to do physical work, um, but that takes power. If a robot is stationary, it's very easy to get the power to it. You just plug it into the wall. But if you want the robot to roam around, um, it's a huge problem. So we believe because of the compactness of full power, it will enable um, robots to, 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 to do the useful work. We want it to be a strong device. We want it to be capable of, of doing sort of superhuman things, or at least human things, uh, in, in this small environment that it might have to operate in to get through to, uh, to a survivor. There are a few companies out there that are actually doing it. And they have a walking robot that's entirely pneumatic, and it can pick up luggage and carry it around. They have another one on wheels that you could imagine following somebody around, holding things, running the baggage carousel, moving baggage around an airport, and you can do these things today. We're always trying to find new, new ideas and new insights to problems, and that's, you know, that's one of the things we like with our university collaborations as well, as it gives us access to some very creative people. The industry is really hungry for having the kind of talent young, smart, hardworking, curious talent that uh, will change the industry and change its image from something that's uh, uh, of the 20th century to something of the 21st century. The diversity of application is so immense that if you have an understanding of fluid power systems uh, and the uh, solutions that it can bring to the table, you're going to be a valuable commodity to a variety of different industries, not just ones that serve more traditional fluid power markets. We need more engineers, certainly, and so, uh, engineers who know how to uh, apply fluid power, how to develop fluid power to the next, next stage, and how to integrate fluid power with other disciplines. For example, um, how to integrate fluid power with the electronics, controls, artificial intelligence, and so on. It's important to understand how those things behave because you're dealing with such sort of high forces and small packages. You have to know how to basically harness that properly. So it's important to study these things, to know exactly how to make these things do what you'd want them to do and no more. Even as I travel with my family on vacation, there is this moment where I see construction machines or agricultural machines, I turn my head and I want to know what type of hydraulics that machine is using. So it gives me that rush, it's exciting, and um, it's, it, it always gets me to think about what's next, what other opportunities can we utilize hydraulic components for. In 20 years, um, I strongly believe we will see more and more fluid power applications. I, I also believe they will have a totally different face if you look um, how fluid power system will operate. I, I, I'm convinced that they will be much simpler. We're, we're starting to move beyond the blacksmith stage. Well, that's well established. You can buy textbooks on the blacksmith's art and uh, practice it over time, but that's only going to get you so far nowadays. And so you have to be able to figure out how to take it to the next level and how to 
uh, apply those engineering principles that you're trained in in new ways to uh, figure out what's beyond the wall. Discovering Fluid Power is a co-production of the University of Minnesota's Center for Compact and Efficient Fluid Power and TPT's Minnesota Channel. Additional support for this program has been provided by the National Fluid Power Association and the National Science Foundation. Think Research Channel.